This is lesson 1.5, and today we're going to be talking about different types of matter. Our goal today is to be able to distinguish different types of matter, learn how compounds and mixtures are different, and to learn methods to separate them. So let's get started. This is a nice table that summarizes a lot of what we're going to be talking about today. So matter can be classified a number of different ways, and one way is to separate it into pure substances and mixtures. Now, pure substances can be further subcategorized into elements and compounds. Elements are the basic building blocks of nature, and so all of the elements that we know are on the periodic table. This, for example, is going to be copper, which is an element, and you can look at this picture here, and it shows you that it's composed of a bunch of the same types of atoms. Compounds, however, are bonded elements, and here's an example. This is sugar, and you can get a close-up of sugar where you see those different atoms that are overlapping to make chemical bonds there in your compound. Mixtures also come in two different varieties. You've got homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures. Homogeneous mixtures are completely even throughout. You can't tell that there's more than one different thing in there, but there is. And you can see here in your close-up that you've got one compound here, another compound here, another compound here, all together in your homogeneous mixture. A heterogeneous mixture has multiple layers. All right, so that is just a preview of what we're going to be talking about today. Let's first focus on elements. An element is a substance that is composed of only one type of atom. So elements are like letters. They are your basic building blocks of matter. And so there are over a hundred different elements known, and scientists are still trying to create new elements today. A few different examples of elements are silver, carbon, helium, iron, gold, nitrogen, phosphorus. And so you can notice with all of these different examples that all of these are found on the periodic table. And sometimes you might see an element written in its name, like helium here, or sometimes you might just see its symbol like Fe here, which is a symbol for iron. Notice also the element symbol might just simply look like this, or it might have a number in it, such as N2 or P4. The number indicates the number of that type of atom that's bonded together. However, there's still elements because they still contain all the same type of atom. As I said earlier, all elements are found on the periodic table. If it's not on the periodic table, it's not an element. Right now, we have 118 different elements on the periodic table, and you can find the heaviest one, 118, right down here. The atomic number of all the different elements is written right above the element symbol, so this one is element 110, and the atomic number indicates the number of protons that that particular element has. A compound is composed of more than one type of element in fixed proportions. Compounds are like words. There are over 100 million different compounds that are known today, and new compounds are being discovered or created every single day. Your compounds are like chemical words because elements, which are like letters, come together in different ways to make a whole bunch of different compounds. Some examples of compounds are as follows. Here we have carbon dioxide, which has the formula CO2, water, sugar, and you'll notice in some compounds, for example, carbon dioxide, that you can tell right there that it's not an element because it's got two different element names right in its name, carbon and oxygen. And you can see in the formula that it's got C and O. It's got two different elements in that formula right there. For common names like water, sugar, salt, and things that you don't find on the periodic table, typically those are going to be compounds but you don't necessarily know until you see the formula. For example, H2O, you can see, okay, that's got hydrogen and oxygen, so it must be a compound. You can see down here in this picture that compounds such as water, in this case, are composed of more than one different element that are bonded together. And you can tell they're bonded because here you have these red spheres which represent oxygen and these gray spheres which represent hydrogen. And you can see that they are overlapping and that overlapping indicates a bond. So pause here for a minute and think about this. Which of these boxes above shows a compound? What do you think? If you said A, you're correct. This is a compound. You can see that those different elements are overlapping. They're bonding. 
and this is exactly the same as that, so it's not a mixture. Here you have a mixture of two different elements. This is an element because they're both red spheres, that is, they're both the same exact element, and this is an element, and you have a mixture of these two different elements together. This here is also a mixture of elements. The only difference is, in this case, they're not bonded. There's no bonding between any of these atoms at all. Just because they're bonding doesn't make it a compound. In this case, you have bonding within an element here, and you can tell that it's not a compound because they are the same color. That is, they are the same type of element or the same type of atom. All right, on to mixtures now. A homogeneous mixture is uniform throughout, whereas a heterogeneous mixture is not uniform. Both homogeneous mixtures and heterogeneous mixtures can be any state of matter. Typically, when people think of mixtures, they're thinking of liquids like this honey here or this oil and water mixed together, but that's not all. Mixtures can also be gases or solids, and so in this case, we have a stainless steel knife that stainless steel is an alloy, which is itself a homogeneous mixture. You can tell it's a homogeneous mixture because that metal is all the same throughout the entire material. Heterogeneous mixtures, however, have variation within the material, like Skittles here, or they have chunks like chunky peanut butter, or they have layers here like this oil and water mixture. As we just mentioned, an alloy is a homogeneous mixture of metals. There's a whole bunch of different alloys that are known. For example, bronze, stainless steel, gold are all different examples of alloys. And it's important to note that like all homogeneous mixtures, the amounts of each component can vary. So where it says bronze is 88% copper, 12% tin, it doesn't have to be. You could make this, let's say, 85% copper and 15% tin. Or you could even throw in some other metal in there too. There are actually a lot of different types of stainless steel. One of the most common types of stainless steel is 1810, which is 18% chromium and 10% nickel. But there are actually a lot of different types of stainless steel. The amounts of iron, chromium, and nickel can vary, and you can even have other metals in there too. Typically, the gold that you're going to buy is not going to be pure gold. Oftentimes, it's got other stuff mixed in it. Now, 24 karat gold is actually an element that is a pure metal. It's an element. However, anything less than 24 karat gold is going to contain a variety of different things such as silver, copper, or zinc. As I mentioned before, mixtures don't have to be liquids. You can also have mixtures that are gases. So, for example, the air is also a mixture. It's a mixture of oxygen, nitrogen, argon, and a bunch of other gases in smaller amounts. Now, typically, the air around us is going to be a homogeneous mixture, but when you look at the sky, it might have clouds in it or smoke in it or other things in it, making it a heterogeneous mixture. Same thing goes with the sea. Salt water itself is a homogeneous mixture, but in the ocean, you can have a whole bunch of different stuff, and that different stuff would make it a heterogeneous mixture. Salt water is a homogeneous mixture of salt and water. Both salt and water are compounds. Now, I'd like to ask you, what do you think? Is all salt water the same? If you think about it, you'd realize the answer is no. Actually, some has more salt, some has less salt. So you can make your own salt water. You can go to the ocean and look at the salt water there. Various different parts of the ocean might have various different amounts of salt in them. And there's some inland lakes that have a lot of salt or a little bit of salt in them. So not at all. Salt water can vary quite a bit going from place to place throughout the earth. It has variable composition. And so we can say, like salt water, mixtures in general have variable composition. That is, there's no one set salt water. There are many different types of salt water, and it can change based on simply the amount of salt you put in the water. How about this? Does salt water have properties similar to what it's made out of, salt and water? And the answer is, when you think about it, of course, yes, right? Salt water tastes like salt, and it looks like water, and it flows like water. It's got properties that mostly derive from both salt and water. We're going to find that compounds, however, are quite different. Both water and sodium chloride are compounds. Now, let's think about it for a second. Is all pure water the same? Except for the minor exception of isotopes, the answer is yes. All water is made out of hydrogen and oxygen in exactly a 2 to 1 ratio. Compounds have a fixed composition. That is, you can't have H3O. It can't be H2.50 or H2O3. 
water is always H2O. There's a fixed amount of hydrogen and a fixed amount of oxygen, and there's no variation anywhere on the earth. Water is always H2O. What about this? Does water have properties that are similar to what it's made out of? Are the properties of water similar to the properties of hydrogen and oxygen? When you think about it, if you think about the properties of water, hydrogen, and oxygen, the answer is really no. The properties of water are completely different. They're nothing like hydrogen, nothing like oxygen. People used to travel around in dirigibles that were filled with hydrogen because just like helium, hydrogen is lighter than air. However, that wasn't entirely safe because hydrogen is flammable. And in fact, one time in the Hindenburg, the entire dirigible went up in flames. And when you have a fire, oxygen is typically necessary for the fire to exist. Oxygen in the air is the oxidant that enables things to burn. So when you think about the properties of hydrogen and oxygen, you're thinking about gases. And one of those gases is very flammable and the other one supports the burning of things. However, water is actually used to put out fires. Water is a liquid at room temperature, it's not a gas, and it's very useful for putting out fires. The properties of water are not at all related to the properties of hydrogen or oxygen. It's something that is completely different. Let's look at another example. What about salt? Salt is made out of sodium and chlorine. Sodium is an element and it's actually a metal. It is a very soft and shiny metal that is easily cut. It's a very interesting property of sodium that you can just take a knife and slice it up. It's really just that soft. Sodium is also a highly reactive element. If you put it in water, it will react vigorously, catch on fire, and maybe even explode. What about chlorine? What are the properties of chlorine? Chlorine is a highly toxic yellow gas. It was even used in World War I to kill people in the trenches. Although it is put in swimming pools to kill bacteria and other microbes, it's actually in a different form when it's put in swimming pools. The element chlorine is really a toxic gas. However, when chlorine and sodium combine, when you take this highly toxic gas and combine it with this highly reactive metal, what do you get? You get table salt. Sodium chloride is a compound of sodium and chlorine, and yet its properties are nothing at all like sodium or chlorine. It's a completely safe, non-reactive, hard, white solid that we put in our food and eat every day. All right, how else can we distinguish compounds from mixtures? A mixture can be separated by physical processes like physically pulling it apart, decantation, filtration, and distillation. However, a compound cannot be separated by physical means. A compound can only be separated into the elements that make it by a chemical reaction. For example, one of the most common ways to separate a compound into its elements is electrolysis. That is, putting electricity through it in order to break apart the bonds and separate those elements. So let's take some time to talk about these different separation techniques. Decantation is a fancy word for a very simple process. If you have a mixture of a solid and a liquid that don't dissolve in each other, like sand and water, all you need to do is just pour off the liquid, such as in this case right here. That's known as decantation, just pouring off the liquid. Filtration is a very important lab technique that's also used to separate liquids from solids. However, the solid-liquid mixture doesn't need to have two different layers. You can just pour the stuff into a filter and the solid will stay up here in the top while the liquid goes down. This is a very similar process to making coffee, right? The coffee grounds stay up here at the top, whereas the coffee you drink comes down here as a liquid. Typically, people use filter paper to perform a filtration, but there's other materials that can also filter things as well. Distillation is another powerful laboratory technique that can separate a mixture of two different liquids. Typically, distillation is used for separating homogeneous mixtures, but it can also be used for separating heterogeneous mixtures. The only requirement is that the two different liquids need to have two different boiling points. Basically, you take that mixture and heat it up, and as you heat it up, the liquid inside that has the lowest boiling point or is easiest to boil will come off first. It'll boil and then you're going to cool it down so it'll turn back into a liquid and then you'll collect it here. The liquids that have higher boiling points will remain and as you increase the temperature, they will slowly come off too. So you'll need to switch out the collector between different components of the mixture. Electrolysis is a chemical process that can separate compounds into elements. 
For example, you can separate water into hydrogen and oxygen if you put electricity through the water. That electricity is able to break apart the bond between hydrogen and oxygen and enable them to separate out into its different components of hydrogen and oxygen. Remember that electrolysis is a chemical process and that only chemical processes can separate compounds into their elements. One last thing that I want to talk about today are chemical formulas. So chemical formulas tell you a lot about the chemical involved. And let's just look at water and sodium chloride. Both water and sodium chloride, as we've said, are compounds. And we can look at these symbols here. The symbols in the formula tell you what elements are in the compound. Now, it's important that you remember for an element, the first letter is always capitalized and the second letter is always lowercase. That will help you realize that this right here, Na, is one single element. The next element starts with a capital letter, right? Capital C, L. So it's very, very important that you always write an element symbol with a capital letter first and then a lowercase letter second. If there is no second letter in the element, it'll simply look like this, H or O, which are single letter element symbols. The subscript tells you the number of atoms in the preceding element in the formula. So this two here refers to the number of hydrogens in H2O. It doesn't tell you anything about the oxygen. Remember, these numbers are always telling you about the previous element in the formula. If there's no subscript, for example, this oxygen, the sodium, and the chlorine all don't have any subscript at all, that means that there's only one of each of those. So we could write this as H2O1, but we don't write ones typically in chemistry. We just assume if there's no number written here that the number is actually one. So there's two hydrogens and one oxygen in H2O. Last of all, let's go ahead and test our knowledge. Tell me if each of these is an element or a compound. Cu, what's that? That, of course, is an element. That's going to be copper. Capital C, lowercase u, you know that's got to be a single element, even if you don't know what element it is. Cucl, what's that? That must be a compound because you have two different elements. You've got copper and you've got chlorine. You can tell that because you've got capital C, lowercase u, and then capital C, lowercase l. And so this capital C here indicates another element is present. How about this? O2. This is an element. It's not a compound. Even though there's this two here, you know it's an element because it only contains oxygen. There's no other element present, so it must simply be an element. CO2, what's that? That is a compound. You've got carbon and oxygen there is a compound of those two different elements. What is CO? That is a compound. It doesn't matter that you don't have numbers here. It's just one carbon and one oxygen, but there's two different elements present, so it must be a compound. What about this? It looks a little bit tricky, but that is an element. Notice that it's very, very important whether you write a lowercase o or a capital O. That lowercase o makes this cobalt. This capital O up here makes this carbon monoxide. Two completely different things. This is a compound and this is an element. How about S8? That is an element. That is sulfur. It doesn't matter that there's an eight here. It's still got only sulfur. So that is an element. All right, that's it for today. Have a great rest of your day. Get started on the homework and stay curious. See ya.